In this video, we'll derive the form to the for the surface area of a solid of revolution. And these sections are maybe a little oddly rearranged. We've got solids of revolution, then arc length, then solids of revolution again. If I were to speculate about why they're arranged like this, it's because there are similarities between what we're about to do with the surface area and what we did with arc lengths as far as deriving the formula goes. So, based on past experience, if we want to find the surface area of a solid of revolution, here's the curve, here's the axis of revolution, our strategy should go something like this. First, Look at the curve on some small sub interval. Estimate the surface area on this sub interval alone. If we can do that, repeat the process. Estimate the surface area we get on each of those subintervals, then add those approximations up to approximate the surface area we want. Take a limit and turn that approximating sum into an exact definite integral. And relating to what I said, that this process bears some similarity to what we did with arc length, we're not going to use rectangles here. We're going to approximate the curve on an interval using a straight line segment. And from the picture, I hope it's clear that the um, surface we get by rotating this straight line segment around the axis and the surface we get by rotating the original curve around the axis are practically identical. But the line segment has the advantage that we know what the surface area of the resulting object is. Or rather, more like we don't know what it is, but we can look it up. The object we get by taking this line segment and rotating it around this axis is called a conic frustum. And its surface area is found as follows. We need two things. First, we need the length of this side of the conic frustum. Call that L. 
Second, the conic frustum has a circle here as its top and a circle here as its bottom. And the cross sections of the conic frustum are also circles. By which I mean, if you took a sheet of paper and you cut the conic frustum in two, you'd get a circle here. So the formula for this surface area is going to involve a radius, not the radius of the big circle or the radius of the small circle, but the radius of the circle you'd get if you cut this object precisely in half. And what is the surface area? It's two times pi times r times l. Now, relating this conic frustum to our original picture, this L is the length of this line segment. Let's give it a different name. Instead of L, let's use a delta S sub I. This R can be thought of as follows. Take this interval, divide it precisely in half. The length of this line segment will be the radius of the conic frustum when we take this and rotate it around the axis. Um, call this point x sub i star. This distance is f. of x sub i star. And this surface area we'll rewrite a second time. So here's our approximate surface area on just one of these little intervals. We'll add our approximations up to find that the surface area of the solid of revolution is approximately this sum. And it might look like we are almost done, but unfortunately we have a fair amount of work cut out for us because this is not a Riemann sum. It looks kind of like a Riemann sum, but it isn't. When you have a Riemann sum, you look at a little subinterval and you look at a point 
in the subinterval. And you have a term that looks like this. Some function evaluated at that point times the length of the subinterval. So this delta S sub i is not the length of this subinterval. So it's not a Riemann sum. And if we take a limit, it won't turn into an integral. More work is necessary. So here's our situation. We've got this sum, and our sum has this delta S sub i term in it, and isn't a Riemann sum. To be a Riemann sum, we would instead need delta X sub i, where delta x sub i is the length of this sub interval. I should say here's the curve, here's the line segment we're using to approximate the curve. Well, delta s sub i, which we have, and delta x sub i, which we want, are at least related to each other. But to write the relationship down, we'll need to define a new term, delta y sub i. Then delta x sub i squared plus delta y sub i squared equals delta s sub i squared from the Pythagorean theorem. And going ahead and taking the square root. The square root of this sum is delta s sub i. So, What's the good of this? Well, remember what we had? We had a sum that looked like this, and it wasn't a Riemann sum because instead of a delta x sub i to match our x term here, we had a delta s sub i. Well, now we can get rid of the delta s sub i and introduce a delta x sub i. So that's the good news. There are two pieces of bad news. First of all, for this to be a Riemann sum, we need some, whatever function we have times delta x sub i. So we have the delta x sub i we want, but it's not saying the rule we need it to play. Instead of just being multiplied out here, it's stuck inside a square root. The second piece of bad news 
is that we have a delta y sub i, and we don't want that. So let's try to deal with that first bit of bad news first. Let's get this delta x sub i out of the square root. We'll start by pulling out a delta x sub i from squared, I should say, from both of these terms. And once we've done that, we can take a square outside of a square root. That gives us this. And this has the form, or at least sort of the form of a Riemann sum. This is good. This is good. This is iffier. But let's take our limit and see what happens. And remember that the particular limit you take when you're trying to go from a Riemann sum to an integral is that you're letting these delta x sub i's go to zero. Let's investigate to this. Let me pause the video while I put a diagram up. Delta y sub i is the difference of f of x sub i and f of x sub i plus delta x sub i. This distance is delta x X sub i, delta y sub i over delta x sub i is therefore this. And we may be using delta x sub i instead of h, but this is indisputably the difference quotient that appears in the definition of the derivative. And we are letting the denominator go to zero in this limit. And as the denominator goes to zero, this turns in to the derivative. Ergo, this becomes one plus the derivative squared. And in this limiting case, our high lost our summation notation, this sum becomes an integral. And we find that the surface area is the integral of two pi f of x times the square root of one plus the derivative squared. As with the arc length formula, you're only going to be able to actually compute this in a few relatively rare situations. But you should know the surface area formula. And if instead of x, everything's in terms of y, we can use the same formula, just as we saw with the volume and the arc length. 